Good day, this is Jim Pytel from Columbia Gorge Community College. This is Digital Electronics. This lecture is entitled Analog to Digital Conversion Methods, Flash Conversion. Before we go into our first of the analog to digital conversion methods, namely flash conversion, what we're going to do is we're going to go over some basic takedowns and kicks before we grapple and pummel these guys to submission. The first uh, we're going to do is review the operation of the basic comparator. This should be super simple for you guys. If you've got any more interest in this thing, potentially go back and hit the 550 five lectures again. What's a comparator? It just compares voltage. It's got two inputs, a negative and a plus, which is higher, a plus or a minus. The answer is a plus. A plus should always be higher. If the plus is higher than the minus, it's true. If the plus is lower than the minus, it's false. So this comparator here I've got up on the uh, upper left, this top one here, excuse me, the upper right. What's this one here? So the plus is at being held at five volts. The minus is at eight volts. The plus is not higher than the minus. So that answer is, is false. Whereas the one immediately below it, what we've got here is, is 16 volts higher than eight volts? The answer is, is yes, true it is. Very simple review of the comparator. We're going to be making use of the comparator a lot, especially in flash conversion, okay? Because that's what it's doing. It's simultaneously comparing voltage levels and it's assigning outputs on there. But before we get into flash directly, I do want to go ahead and perform a review of the operational amplifier. Not necessarily used for flash, but some of the other methods that we're going to be going over, and especially for digital to analog conversion, the opposite. We're going to be using the operational amplifier, so may as well just go ahead and knock this thing out now. Don't mean to scare you guys, because I know some of you guys have just gone through semiconductor devices and circuits, but I certainly hope you know how an operational amplifier works. If you don't, here's how it works. It's very simple. It has two inputs, an inverting input signified by the negative, a non-inverting input signified by the positive, and a single output. There are two characteristics about an operational amplifier. And what's awesome about this summary is we can pretend it's a magic device. Okay, don't you wish you could have done that in semiconductor devices and circuits one and two? I know you know the internal workings of these things, but for our intents and purposes, it's magic. The first magical property is the inverting and the non-inverting inputs are being held at the same potential. And number two magical property is no current can enter the operational amplifier. It's extremely high impedance. There's no current entering it. So consider, if you will, this diagram over here. Making use of these two properties here, let's describe how an, uh, this operational amplifier has worked. Look at the non-inverting input. It's being tied to ground, okay, right here. Okay, so by property one, what does this mean? The inverting and non-inverting inputs are being held at the same potential. What is this input being held at? Well, the answer is, is ground. So that's known as a virtual ground. It's not really connected to ground, but if our ground is in fact really at zero volts, the non-inverting, excuse me, the inverting input is also being held to zero volts. So we could potentially kind of draw a ground symbol right there. In and of itself there, that's not especially earth shattering, but check it out. There's an input voltage over here being applied to one end of the resistor, RI, input resistor, and the other end of RI is being held to ground because of property one. What does that mean? Okay, if there's a voltage gradient, if VI is higher than ground, what's going to happen? Conventional current will flow from positive to negative, to or positive in this case, to a lower potential. Current is flowing through resistor RI. Now, magical property number two comes into play here. What's magical property two in state? No current enters the op amp. If there is current coming into that node, i.e. the inverting input, and none of it's going into the op amp, where is it going? Well, according to Kirchhoff's current law, what comes in equals what comes out. So if there's a certain amount of current in to that node and none of it goes into the op amp, where does it go? Okay, current is being forced through RF in this particular case, the only other path there is. So what's happening to RF? This is really neat here. If current is flowing through RF, there is a voltage drop across RF. And if current is, in this particular case, flowing from left to right, but the left-hand side is being held at ground. Stands to conjecture if current is flowing to the right, VO should be a lower potential than ground. So a negative value. So what we could do is start coming up with some 
equations here, there is an output voltage V out that is proportional to the relationship of RF and RI. And I'll go ahead and do some basic mathematic to go ahead and show you how this works. Okay, so what is that current I? Let's just look at it from this perspective here, going through R1. Well, according to Ohm's law, perhaps you've heard of it, the current through a resistor is the voltage across a resistor divided by its resistance. Okay, so that's the current through Ri. But like I said, due to property two, that same current is flowing in Rf. What's the voltage drop across Rf when there's a current through it? Well, perhaps you've heard of Ohm's law, where voltage is equal to current times resistance. We've got to go ahead and do a little bit of math magic here because it's flowing to a lower potential, our V out, negative V O in this particular case, because it's negative with respect to there, it's I R F. So notice what we've got here is this same value, I, in each one of these. What we can do is do a little bit more math and magic and come up with a relationship where VO and VI are related to RF and RI. And what we get is something like this, where the ratio of VO over VI is equal to negative RF RI, hence the term operational amplifier. Because if we set up the ratio of RF to be greater than RI, our output voltage VO will be greater in magnitude with that of VI. Yes, there's a negative term there because current is flowing conventionally from that inverting input to VO, but it doesn't really matter because what we're looking for is that gain, hence the term operational amplifier. So a super quick review on the comparator. Another quick review on the operational amplifier. Like I said, the operational amplifier you're going to use in some other methods here, not necessarily so much in Flash. I wanted to put this now to potentially think about these things as you move on to some of these other methods. Let's go ahead and go into Flash conversion for this particular lecture about analog to digital conversion methods. Okay, so now that we've done a brief review of some of the components that we'll be using in analog to digital conversion methods, let's actually apply the comparator in use of Flash analog analog to digital conversion. It's one of my favorites. The reason why, it's simple. It's so easy to understand. And what's really cool about that, it's fast. Everything is occurring simultaneously. Think of the word flash. Just like every single redneck bonfire you've been to, it started off with somebody pouring a bunch of gas on it and flash, it explodes simultaneously. Okay, that's exactly what flash analog to digital conversion is doing. There's no waiting. There's not a lot of math involved with that. The problem is to do everything simultaneously, think about having eight hands. You got to have you know eight pieces of hardware to do a certain amount. If you want to go ahead and continue to have more resolution there, you're going to have to have 16 hands and 32 hands. There's a lot of hardware that goes with this. That being said, it doesn't necessarily outweigh its advantages of being so fast and so simple. Because as hardware gets cheaper, you might find flash analog to digital conversion methods becoming more and more affordable. The basics of a flash analog to digital converter are three things. A voltage divider network, very similar to what we saw in the 555 timer. A bunch of comparators, very similar to what we saw in the 555 timer. Finally, a priority encoder. Okay, we'll go each one over these ones in turn. The voltage divider network, very similar to the 555 timer, all it is is a network of dumb identical resistors. And according to the voltage divider rule, if every single resistor is identical, every single resistor will have an identical voltage drop across it. What we've got here is this ref the reference voltage. And if I put, because I've got eight resistors there, and just because I want to keep the analysis this simple, if I put eight volts as my reference, what is the voltage drop across to each resistor? Well, the answer is, is one volt. So at this point right here, after the first resistor, you should get seven volts, six volts. You can figure it out, the rest of it. So what I'm doing is I'm establishing reference points for each one of those comparators to compare what's to? Well, the answer is, is V in. Notice how every single comparator's positive input is getting that V in. What is it, the negative input? Well, it's inputting from the voltage divider network, okay? What is that first, excuse me, that top comparator comparing with? Well, it's comparing my analog voltage in with seven volts. What's the second comparator comparing to? Well, it's comparing the analog voltage in with six volts and so on and so forth all the way through there. So what I'm doing is, is 
I'm setting up a simultaneous comparison of a bunch of different voltage levels. And that's exactly what makes flash so fast. It's occurring simultaneously. And finally, this third thing here, what is this? Well, this is a priority encoder. What does an encoder do? It outputs a code that indicates the presence of an input. In this particular case, it's a priority encoder. What is priority? If you remember right, priority is a means of resolving simultaneous inputs. In this particular case, what we're doing here is the highest input has priority. So when you put all three of these things together, they're very, very, very simple concepts. Voltage divider, bunch of comparators, checking out those inputs from the voltage divider, and then a priority encoder making use of the comparator's outputs. What's going to finally spit out the answer here? This is the digital approximation for that. So say, for example, I have a voltage in an analog input voltage of 5.5 volts. Do the analysis for every single comparator and just look at the comparators right now. Okay, let me clean this up here for you. So I've cleaned this up here a little bit. And again, what is our input voltage? It's right here. And for this particular portion of the example, we're going to say 5.5 volts. Look at the top comparator. Is 5.5 volts on the positive input, what will it have on the output if the negative input is a 7? Is 5.5 greater than 7? The answer is, is false. Is 5.5 greater than 6? The answer is false. Is 5.5 greater than 5? The answer is true, 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 true. So as we go through there, what we're finding is, is basically this is that bracketing I was talking about here. If it's greater than five but less than six assign it what well this is the input well these are also inputs but because it's a priority input it's ignoring those lower inputs so five is my input what is my output well understandably five one zero one okay i've got the digitized output there so for a value of 5.5 volts what is my digital representation of that it's one zero one Want too simple. Let's say, and again, how am I doing this to sample this thing? It's right here. It's this enable pulse there. Flashing that enable, allowing this thing to happen at a rate consistent with me um, trying to represent that waveform. Let's say my analog input voltage goes down to 3.5 volts. I've disabled the device. Okay, so I've disabled the device. Our analog input voltage is now, as I said, 3.5 volts. What are the outputs for every single one of those comparators? It should look something like this. There we go. So it's 7060504031211 volt 1. All of these inputs are asserted for the one, two, and three. However, because it's a priority encoder, this is the one that is cheese priority. What is my output when suddenly this thing is enabled via a pulse? What I get is zero, one, one. Again, illustrating that bracketing concept. 3.5 is greater than three, but less than four, so we may as well call it a three. So how do we increase the resolution of something like this? Well, the answer is, is obviously use a priority encoder that has more bits perhaps a 4-bit priority encoder. But be aware though, as you have a 4-bit priority encoder, you're going to have to have that many more comparators. Okay, this is the this is one major disadvantage of this thing. For us to increase the resolution here, we're gonna have to add double the amount of comparators just because we added one more bit position to this. Additionally, let's think about the range. Okay, now I've used an example of eight volts there as my reference. You know, let's say I want to double my range. I'll just take my reference voltage. It's now 16 volts. What does every single one of this voltage divider inputs do? Well, it changes. Okay, so now there are two volts. We've got 14, 12, 10, 8, 6, 4, and 2 volts. Okay, now what is the output? The digital, let's stay with a 3 bit right here. All uh, when our input is 3.5 volts. So it's greater than 2. Yes, it is. Is it greater than 4? No, 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 no. I have not changed the input voltage. I haven't changed the priority encoder. I haven't changed anything. The only thing I changed was the range at which these things are represented. And notice here that the only input that is asserted is the one. So zero, zero, one. Whereas previously we had zero, one, one representing three volts. Whereas right now what we've got is zero, zero, one. 
representing those three volts. So you have to understand that reference voltage will change the very nature of the voltage divider network. And all you're doing is comparing these things. You know, you could have a million volts on that reference, provided you can find a comparator that will stand on a million volt input and be comparing half a million volts on the input there. But what you're trying to do is you're looking for those logical outputs of the comparator to be sent to the priority encoder. And that is honestly it for flash analog to digital conversion. It's that easy. And we did this thing in maybe seven minutes of discussion directly about flash analog to digital conversion. It is fast, it's simple, requires a little bit of a hardware, and it's using these three basic things we've discussed here, voltage divider to set up different values to compare it to. Obviously, it's using comparators and using priority and encoder to make this thing happen. Okay, this concludes flash analog to digital conversion. Let's go on to a different method.